bloody this fight we have ahead of us. Um, it's so important for all of us from different, different angles to come at it, but to understand that what we are facing is something truly frightening. Um, and if I would say place of, especially in India. So uh, this, this 43 minutes and 13 and a half seconds that I have, I actually want to read to you from this last lecture, which I wrote to be delivered uh, in Tennessee. Unfortunately, I didn't deliver it in person because of some dispute between the union and Trinity but it was published yesterday. It's a lecture in English literature. I know that uh, you know, you're not an English literature institute, so I'm going to try and uh, remove the literature part of it. <laughs> <laughs> About the rest. But that was me. I'm warning you a little literature, so I can't seem to say anything without somehow getting into storytelling. So uh, the, le the lecture was called The Graveyard Talks Back, Fiction in the Time of Fake News. <clears throat> um, so graveyards in India are for the most part Muslim graveyards because Christians make up a minuscule part of the population. And as you know, Hindus and most other communities cremate their dead. The Muslim graveyard, the Kabristan has always loomed large in the imagination and rhetoric of Hindu nationalists. Musliman ka ehi stan, Kabristan ya Pakistan. Only one place for the Musliman, the graveyard or Pakistan, is among the more secret, more frequent war cries of the murderous, sword wielding militias and vigilante mobs that have overrun India's streets. As the Hindu right has taken almost complete control of the state as well as non-state apparatuses, the increasingly blatant social and economic boycott of Muslims has pushed them further down the societal ladder and made them even more unwelcome in secular public spaces and housing colonies. For reasons of safety as well as necessity, in urban areas, many Muslims, including the elite, are retreating into enclaves that are often hatefully re referred to as mini Pakistan. Now in life, as in death, segregation <coughs> is becoming the rule. In cities like Delhi, meanwhile, the homeless and destitute congregate in shrines and around graveyards, which have become resting places not just for the dead, but for the living too. I speak today about the Muslim graveyard the Kabristan as the new ghetto, literally as well as metaphorically, of the new Hindu India, and about writing fiction in these times. I'll try not to do that. <clears throat> in some senses, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, my novel published in 2017, can be read as a conversation between two graveyards. One, a graveyard where Anju, born as a boy to a Muslim family in the wall city of Delhi, makes her home and gradually builds a guest house, the Janat guest house. Janat means uh, paradise in Urdu, where a range of people come and seek shelter. The other, the ethereally beautiful valley of Kashmir, which is now, after 30 years of war, covered with graveyards, and in this way has become, metaphorically, almost a graveyard itself. So a graveyard covered by the Janat guest house, and a Janat covered with graveyards. This conversation, this chatter between two graveyards is and always has been strictly prohibited in India. In the real world, it's considered a high crime, treasonous even. Fortunately, in fiction, at home, different rules apply. Before we get to the forbidden conversation, let me describe for you the view from my writing desk. Some writers may wish to shut the window or move to another room, but I cannot. So you will have to bear with me because it is in this landscape that I heat my stove and store my pots and pans. It is here that I make my literature. Today marks the 194th day 
of the Indian government shut down, of the internet in Kashmir. After months of having no access to mo mobile data or broadband, about 7 million Kashmiris who live under the densest military occupation in the world have been allowed to view what is known as a white list, a handful of government approved websites. These include a few selected news portals, but not the social media that Kashmiris so depend on, given the hostility to them of the mainstream Indian media, to put out their version of their life. In other words, Kashmir now has a formally firewalled internet, which could well be the future for many of us in the world. It's the equivalent of giving a thirsty person water from an eyedropper. <clears throat> and so since 2014, India has had 365 internet shutdowns. In, uh, recently, the protests in Delhi and Uttar Pradesh, they started doing that as well, you know, shutting down the internet. The internet shutdown has crippled almost every aspect of daily life in Kashmir. The full extent of the hardship it has caused has not even been studied yet. It's a pioneering experiment in the mass violation of human rights. The information siege aside, thousands of Kashmiris, including children, civil society activists, and political figures are imprisoned, some under the Draconian Public Safety Act. These are just the bare bones of an epic and continuously unfolding tragedy. While the world looks away, business has ground to a halt, tourism has slowed to a trickle, Kashmir has been silent and slowly falling off the map. None of us needs to be reminded of what happens when places fall off the map. When the blowback comes, I for one will not be among those feigning surprise. Meanwhile, the Indian government has passed a new citizenship law that even if intricately constructed is blatantly discriminatory against Muslims. So that is the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, which comes along with two other programs called the National Population Register and the National Register of Citizens. So when you look at these three together, you see a, a process which started in the eastern state of Assam, where already two million, almost two million people are off the register, and therefore run the risk of being declared stateless. And it's so much chaos there, the detention centers are being built, and yet, uh, you know, instead of being shocked by the chaos, the government has announced its intention to do it in all of India. And, and very, very blatantly targeting the Muslim community as policy, but in implementation, obviously the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities of people who don't have any kind of papers. I mean, even not the vulnerable people, but you know, obviously it is a, a class issue. So those who don't have papers will be destabilized. People like Amartya and I actually belong in a detention center because we do have these Bangladeshi links, but they won't put us there, but everybody else is, is going to be living in this, in the system of destabilized existence, you know, prey to all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> I won't, I, I've written about this in a lecture I delivered last November, so I'm not going to elaborate a lot on it, except to say that it could create a crisis of statelessness on a scale previously unknown. It is for the Russia Swayam Seva Sangh, the wellspring of Hindu nationalism and the parent of Narendra Modi's Bhartiya Janata Party, <coughs> what Germany's 1935 Nuremberg laws were for the Third Reich, conferring upon it the power to decide who was a rightful citizen and who wasn't, based on specific documents that people were expected to produce to prove their heredity. That lecture, Intimations of an Ending, is one of the bleakest texts I have ever written. Three months on, that bleakness has turned into cautious hope. The Citizenship Amendment Bill was passed in Parliament on the 11th of December 2019 and became the Citizenship Amendment Act. Within days, students rose, the first to react were the students of Aligarh Muslim University and Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi. In response, riot police attacked the campuses with tear gas and stun guns, 
Students were ruthlessly beaten, some were maimed, and one was blinded in one eye. Anger is now spread to campuses across the country and spilled over into the streets. Outraged citizens led from the front by students and Muslim women have occupied public squares and blocked roads for weeks together. The Hindu right, which lavishes enormous energy on stigmatizing the Muslim man as a woman-hating terrorist jihadi, and even offers itself up as the savior of Muslim women, is a little confounded by this brilliant, articulate, and very female anger. In Delhi's now iconic Shaheen Bagh protest, thousands, tens of thousands, and sometimes a hundred thousand people have blocked a major road for almost two months. This has spawned many Shaheen Baghs across the country. Millions are on the street, taking back their country, waving the Indian flag and pledging to uphold the Indian constitution and reading out its preamble which says India is a secular socialist republic. The anthem of this new uprising, the slogan that is reverberating through towns and college campuses and crossroads across the country, is a variation of the iconic chant of the Kashmiri freedom struggle. Hum kya chahte azadi. What do we want? Freedom. That slogan is the refrain within a set of <coughs> lyrics that describes people's anger, their dream, and the battle ahead. It's not to suggest that any one group can claim ownership of the Azadi slogan. It has a long and varied history. There was the slogan of the Iranian Revolution and a section of the feminist movement in our subcontinent in the 1790s. But over the last three decades, it has more than anything else become known as the anthem of the Kashmiri streets. And now, while Kashmiri streets have been silenced, the irony is that its people's refrain, with similar lyric, rhythm, and cadence, echoes on the streets of the country that most Kashmiris view as their colonizer. What lies between the silence of one street and the sound of the other? Is it a chasm? or could it become a bridge? To be sure, protesters in India are calling for an entirely different kind of azadi. Azadi from poverty, from hunger, from caste, from patriarchy, and from repression. It's not azadi from India, it's azadi in India, says Kanaya Kumar, the charismatic young politician, credited with customizing and retooling the chant for the uprising in India today. On the street, every one of us is painfully aware that even an atom of sympathy for the Kashmiri cause, expressed by even a single person, even accidentally, will be met by nationalist hellfire that will incinerate not just the protest, but every last person standing. And if that person happens to be Muslim, it will be something exponentially worse than even hellfire. Because when it comes to Muslims, for everything from parking tickets to petty crimes, different rules apply. Not on paper, but effectively. That's how deeply unwell India has become. <clears throat> At the heart of these massive democratic protests of the anti Muslim citizenship laws, therefore, inside this borrowed song from Kashmir, is an enforced pin drop silence over crimes committed in the Kashmir Valley. That silence is decades old, and the shame of it is corrosive. The shame must be shared not just by Hindu nationalists, not just by India's entire political spectrum, but also by the majority of the Indian people, including many who are bravely out on the street today. It's a hard thing to have to hold in one's heart. But perhaps it's only a matter of time before the cry for justice by the young on India's streets will come to include the demand for justice for Kashmiris too. Perhaps this is why in the BJP rule state of Uttar Pradesh, the Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath, seen by many as a Modi in the making, has declared the Azadi slogan to be ceaseless. <coughs> the government's response to protests has been ferocious. Modi fired the starting gun with his trademark toxic innuendo. At an election rally, he said, protests Protesters could be easily identified by their clothes, implying that they were all Muslim. This is untrue, but it serves to clearly mark off the population that must be punished. In Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath has 
like some kind of gangster openly vowed revenge. More than 20 people have been killed so far. At a public tribunal a few weeks ago, I heard testimonies of how police in the state are entering people's homes in the dead of night, terrorizing and looting them. People spoke of being kept naked and beaten for days in police lockup. They described how hospitals had turned away critically injured people, how Hindu doctors had refused to treat them. In videos of the police attacking protesters, the slurs they use against Muslims are unspeakable. Their muttered prejudice is almost <coughs> more frightening than the injuries they inflict. When a government openly turns on a section of its own population, with all the power at its disposal, the terror it generates is not easy for those outside that community to comprehend or even believe. Needless to say, political support for Aditya Nath has been forthright and unflinching. Uh, the governor of West Bengal, the BJP, the BJP president of West Bengal boasted, our government shot them like dogs. Uh, a union minister in Modi's cabinet addressed a rally in Delhi with shouts of, Desh ke gaddaron ko, and the crowd screamed back, Goli maro salon ko, what's to be done with traitors of the nation? Shoot the bastards. A member of parliament said that unless the protesters of Shaheen Bagh were dealt with, they would enter homes and rape their sisters and daughters, which is an interesting idea considering the protests. Protesters are predominantly women. As India embraces majoritarian Hindu nationalism, which is a pro polite term for fascism, many liberals and even communists continue to be squeamish about using that term. This notwithstanding the fact that the RSS ideologues are openly <coughs> worshipful of Hitler and Mussolini, and that Hitler has found his way onto the cover of an Indian school textbook about great world leaders alongside Modi and Gandhi. The division in opinion on the use of the term comes down to whether you believe that fascism becomes fascism only after a continent was destroyed and millions of people were exterminated in gas chambers or whether you believe that fascism is an ideology that led to those high crimes, that can lead to those high crimes, and that those who subscribe to it are fascists. The scaffolding, the skeletal structure over which the specious rock that fuels fascism drapes itself, it shapes you. The foundation on which that scaffolding rests is fake history, perhaps the oldest form of fake news. <laughs> the history being peddled by Hindu nationalists, that happy tale of spurious valor and exaggerated victimhood, in which history is turned into mythology and mythology into history, has been very ably perforated and demolished by serious scholars. But the tale was never meant for serious scholars. It was meant for an audience that few serious scholars can hope to reach. While we laugh with derision, it is spreading like an epidemic and blossoming in the popular imagination like a brain-deadening malignancy. But there's something deeper and more disturbing at work here, which I cannot go <coughs> on, though I would just gesture towards. If any of my assertions startle you, please know that I have elaborated on them at length in a book called The Doctor and the State. At the heart of Hindu nationalism and the cult of Hindu supremacy is the principle of Varnashram Dharma, the caste system, or what the anti-caste tradition calls Brahmanwad, Brahminism. Brahminism organizes society in a vertical hierarchy based on a supposedly celestially ordained graded scale of purity and pollution, pollution entitlement and duty, and hereditary occupation. Right on top of the ladder are Brahmins, the embodiment of purity and the resting place of all entitlements. At the bottom are the outcasts, Dalits, once known as untouchables, who have been dehumanized, ghettoed, and violated in unimaginable ways for centuries. None of these categories is homogenous. Each is divided into its own universe of hierarchy. The principles of equality, fraternity, or sorority is anathema to the caste system. It's not hard to see how the idea that some human beings are inherently superior 
or inferior to others by divine mandate, slides even easily into the fascist idea of a master race. To escape the tyranny of Brahmanism, over the centuries, millions of Dalits and people from other subjugated castes converted to Islam, Sikhism, and Christianity. So the politics of Hindu majoritarianism and its persecution of minorities is also intricately, intricately intertwined with the question of caste. Even today, caste is the engine and the organizing principle that runs almost every aspect of modern Indian society. And yet so many celebrated writers, historians, philosophers, sociologists, filmmakers, have collectively managed to produce a formidable body of work on India, work that is domestically as well as internationally applauded and handsomely rewarded, that even turns caste into a footnote or completely elides the issue. I would call that place history too, the great project of unseen. A fine example of this is Sir Richard Attenborough's Oscar-winning Gandhi, which was co-funded by the government of India. The film is inaccurate to the point of being false about Gandhi's time in South Africa and his attitude toward black South Africans. Almost more disturbing is the complete absence of Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, who is easily as much or more of an icon in India as Gandhi is. Ambedkar, a Dalit from Maharashtra, was the man who challenged Gandhi morally, politically, and intellectually. He denounced Hinduism and the caste discrimination it entailed and showed Dalits a path, path out by renouncing the Hindu religion in favor of Buddhism. Both were extraordinary men, and the conflict between them has contributed greatly to our thinking today. While Gandhi's views of caste were not inimical to those of the Hindu right, his views on the place of Muslims in India were, and that is what, what eventually led to his assassination by a former member, although some say a member, of the RSS. Still, what does it mean, this exalted, seriously falsified mythification of Gandhi and the erasure of Ambedkar in a government co-funded, a Congress government co-funded, multi-million dollar media extravaganza that still forms the basis of most of the world's idea of Gandhi and the freedom struggle. Yes, the film was made a long time ago, but where's the corrective, the other extravaganza that tries, at least tries to tell the truth? Where are the big films about Kabir, Ravi Das, Ambedkar, Periyar, Ayankali, Pandita, Ramabai, Jyoti Bhatt, and Savitri Bai Kule, and all those who fought against caste through the ages? There are Indian liberals who sternly castigate the British for leaving British colonialism out of their history books, but are guilty of exactly the same wrongdoing when it comes to the practice of caste. In South Africa, Gandhi tried to distance dominant caste passenger Indians from oppressed caste indentured laborers and black Africans, whom he called captives and savages, a campaign that he sustained for years. In 1894, he wrote an open letter to the Natal Legislative Assembly that Indians and English both spring <coughs> from a common stock called the Indo Army. This is the conceit of many dominant caste Hindus even today. They like to think of themselves as a conquering race of Aryan descent. And yet, when it comes to the Muslim question, they suddenly transform themselves into the Aboriginal son of the soil of the Hindu homeland and mark Muslims and Christians off as foreigners. To our paid up Hindu fascists known affectionately as the Sangh Parivar, the family collective, Muslims are the internal enemy whose loyalties, real loyalties lie outside India. For many good-hearted liberals, Muslims are welcome guests, but guests nevertheless, burdened with the expectation of good behavior, which is a terrible thing to trust on fellow citizens. It's like giving women rights as long as they promise to be good, good mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters. Even the most well-intentioned progressive people often counter anti-Muslim slander by talking up Muslim patriotism. Many liberals, including some Muslims themselves, have described Muslims as Indians by choice and not by chance. 
suggesting that they chose to stay in India and not move to Pakistan after partition in 1947. Many did, many didn't, and for many the choice simply did not exist. But to frame Indian Muslims as a people who are in India by choice draws a dangerous ring, a false bloodline around a whole population, suggesting it has a less elemental relationship to the land and could just as well live elsewhere. This plays straight into the binary of the good Muslim, bad Muslim, Muslim patriot, Muslim jihadi, and could inadvertently trap a whole population into having to redeem itself with a lifetime of regular flag waving and constitution reading, which is very bad for the country. <laughs> it also inadvertently shows up the appalling logic of Hindu nationalism. Muslims have so many homelands, but Hindus have only India. The corollary to this, of course, is the well-known taunt thrown at Muslims as well as anyone else who challenges the Hindu nationalist view. Go to Pakistan. <laughs> All of this to say that the foundation of today's fascism, the unacceptable fake history of Hindu nationalism, rests on a deeper foundation of another apparently more acceptable, more sophisticated set of fake histories that elide the stories of caste, of women, and a range of other genders, and of how those stories intersect below the surface of the grand narrative of class and capital. To challenge fascism means to challenge all of this. Sometimes I feel self-servingly, perhaps, the way a surgeon has saved in surgery, that fiction is uni uniquely positioned to do this. Because fiction has the capaciousness, the freedom and latitude to hold out a universe of complexity. Because every human being is really a walking sheet of identity, a Russian doll that contains identities within identities, each of which can be shuffled around, each of which may defy some and simultaneously comply with other normal conventions by which people are crudely and cruelly defined, identified, and organized, particularly so in this feudal medieval society of ours in India, one that is pretending to be modern, yet continues to practice one of the most brutal forms of social hierarchy in the world. I'm not talking here of fiction as an expose or the writer of social wrongs part of the sun. Nor do I mean fiction that is a disguised manifesto or is written in order to address a particular issue or subject. I mean fiction that attempts to recreate the universe of the familiar, but then makes visible the pro what the project of unseen seeks to conceive. The project of unseen works in mysterious ways. It can even appear in the seductive avatar of high praise. For example, in my first novel, The God of Small Things, published more than 20 years ago, sexual and emotional transgression across caste lines and the complicated relationship between caste and communism are central themes. Much has been said about the novel's lyricism, its metaphors, its structure, its understanding of children's minds. But except in Kerala, where the novel was very well understood and therefore ran into some hostility. I was uh, dragged to court for corrupting public morality. <laughs> the caste question tends to be glossed over or treated as a class issue, as though Ammo and Melissa were Lady Chatelet and Oliver Mellon. This is to understand absolutely nothing about Indian society. Certainly class and caste overlap, but they aren't identical as India's many communist parties are discovering to their parents. One of the most prominent faces in the protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act is a young Dalit politician who heads the Bhim Army, named after Bhim Rao Ambedkar. He calls himself Chandrasekhar Azad Ravan. Ravan was, of course, the demon that Lord Ram uh, vanquished in Lanka, in, in, in Sri Lanka. And uh, you know, that battle is seen as by Hindus as a battle of good against evil. So what does that signify when, when a person has chosen to not just honor but personify Ravan 
drums, vanquish, demon foe. It's an audacious declaration that at least some people view Hinduism, not just Hindu Twa, the Hindu nationalist political ideology, but Hinduism, the religion, as a form of colonialism and cruel subjugation. Raman is on the front page, a, a subjugation of Aryans uh, by the <coughs> Ottomans. So it's like the making history into mythology and mythology into history. Raman is on the front page of the papers, infuriating the government by making common cause with the Muslim community. He appeared late one night on the crowded steps of Delhi's Jama Masjid, a night filled with shouts of Jai Bhim and Intilab Jindaba, long live Bhimrao Ambedkar and long live the revolution. A precarious solidarity is evolving between Muslims and Ambedkarites and followers of other anti-caste leaders like Jyotiba and Savitri Bhai Pule, Sant Ravidas and Birsa Munda, as well as a new generation of young leftists who, unlike the older generation, place caste alongside class at the center of their worldview. It's still brittle, still, still full of material and ideological contradictions, still full of suspicion and resentment, but it's the only hope we have. The trouble is that this fragile coalition is being slaughtered even as it is being born. The fake news project, its history department, as well as its current affairs desk, has corporatized, Bollywoodized, televised, Twitterized, atomized, weaponized, WhatsAppized, and is disseminating its product at the speed of light. It's all around us. It's the weather we endure and the air we breathe. It's the smell of spring and the winter chill. It's what we see and hear and swim in. It's the threat, it's the promise, it's the great pillar that presses down on our hearts in our dreams and in our waking hours. It's what we react to and what we write against. And it's what makes writing that most perilous of activities, whose consequences are not literary prizes or good or bad reviews. For some of us, every sentence spoken, written, real or fake, every word, every punctuation mark can be torn from the body of a text, mangled and turned into a court notice, a police case, a mob attack, a television lyn lynching by crazed news anchors, India's speciality, or, <laughs> as in the case of the journalist Gauri Lankesh and so many less well-known others, an assassination. Gauri was shot dead outside her home in Bangalore in September 2017. The last message she sent me was a photograph of her holding up the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Assassination is the extreme end of the spectrum. Elsewhere on it are threats, arrests, beatings, and if you're a woman, fake videos and character assassinations, she's a whore, she's a drunk, Neither of which do I personally consider myself. <laughs> and not to forget, we all have favorites, she should be gang raped. Attacks on people with a profile, like myself, whether they are wildly defamatory or absolutely true, she's not a Hindu, or a physical attack on meetings and stages or legal harassment in false cases are usually appeals for the attention of the BJP high command by political workers aspiring for, for a promotion, a kind of job application, because it's well known that those who show this kind of initiative are often rewarded, lynchers are fated, those accused of murder become cabinet ministers. In keeping with the spirit, days before the Ministry of Utmost Happiness was published, a reasonably well-known Bollywood actor who is also a member of the BJP in Parliament said that the Indian uh, suggested that the Indian Army tie me to a jeep and use me as a human shield in Kashmir, as it had re recently done with the Kashmiri civilian. All this is nothing compared to what millions of people in India are having to live through. I mention it only in order to think aloud about how this continuous and seizing threat affects writers and their writing. Each one of us reacts differently, of course. Speaking for myself, as the pressure mounts and the windows are shut one by one, 
Every cell of my writing brain seems to want to force them open again. Does that shrink or expand writers, sharpen or blunt them? Most people, I imagine, believe they can restrict a writer's range and imagination, steal away those moments of intimacy and contemplation, without which a literary text does not amount to very much. I have often caught myself wondering if I were to be incarcerated or driven underground, would it liberate my writing? Would what I write become simpler, more lyrical, perhaps less negotiated? It's possible. But right now, as we struggle to keep the windows open, I believe our liberation lies in the negotiation. Hope lies in texts that can accommodate and keep alive our intricacies, our complexity, and our density against the onslaught of the terrifying, <coughs> sweeping simplification of fascism. As they barrel toward us, speeding down their straight, smooth highway, we greet them with our beehives, our maids. We keep our complicated world, with all its seams exposed, alive in our writing. After 20 years of writing fiction and non-fiction that tracks the rise of Hindu nationalism, after years of reading about the rise and fall of European fascism, I've begun to wonder why fascism, although it's by no means the same everywhere, is so recognizable across histories and cultures. It's not just the fascists that are recognizable. The strong man, the ideological army, the squalid dreams of Aryan superiority, the dehumanization and ghettoization of the eternal enemy, the massive and utterly ruthless propaganda machine, the false flag attacks and assassination, the falling businessmen and film stars, the attack on universities, the fear of intellectuals, the specter of detention camps, and the hate-fueled zombie population that chants the Eastern equivalent of high, high, high. But it's also the rest of us, the exhausted quarreling opposition, the vain, nitpicking left, the echo-rotating liberal who spent years building the road that has led us to the situation we find ourselves in and are now behaving like shocked, righteous rabbits who never imagined that rabbits were an important ingredient of the rabbit stew that was always on the menu. <laughs> and of course, the wolves who ignored the decent folks' counsel of moderation and sloped off into the wilderness to howl unceasingly, futilely, and if they were female, then shrilly and hysterically, and the terrifying, misshapen moon. All of us are recognizable. So at the end of it all, is fascism a kind of feeling in the way anger, fear, or love are feelings that manifest itself in recognizable ways across cultures? Does a country fall into fascism the way a person falls in love, or more accurately, in hate. Has India fallen in hate? Because truly the most palpable feeling in the air is the barbaric hatred the current regime and its supporters show towards a section of the population. But equally palpable now is the love that has risen to oppose this. You can see it in people's eyes, hear it in protesters' song and speech. It's a battle of those who know how to think against those who know how to hate. A battle of lovers against haters. It's an unequal battle because the love is on the street and vulnerable. The hate is on the street too, but it is armed to the teeth and protected by all the machinery of the state. Okay, that's half a lecture, please. <laughs>